Hello. Welcome to Culture Vultures. I'm Sandy Fry, your host. Our creative producer is Nancy Cole, and this is a program that examines arts and culture throughout the Tampa Bay area. And we've got two very interesting guests, so I'm going to get right to it. Our first, at the age of six, completed his first crossword puzzle. Now, at the age of six, most children are still struggling with reading. But he followed that up at 16 by selling a crossword puzzle to the New York Times and simultaneously becoming the youngest puzzler ever to do that. And then the rest is pretty much history. Uh, during the mid-1990s, created puzzles that appeared in a myriad of uh, newspapers. He began earlier uh, by doing puzzles for the San Francisco Examiner, now the Chronicle. Uh, and then in the 90s, appeared in Los Angeles Times, Seattle Times, Philadelphia Inquirer, and more, including his flagship uh, paper now, the Washington Post, and that's very good taste, I should say. Thank you. <laughs> uh, he is self-syndicated. He has been featured on Oprah, on Nighttime with Ted Koppel, on Talk of the Nation. He co-starred with Will Shorts, who's the New York Times uh, puzzle editor, in something called Wordplay, which attracted the attention of the creators of The Simpsons, who said, hey, we're going to have an episode with puzzles. And both of them were represented in it. And now he lives in Tampa, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. But I'd like to welcome Merle Regal. Thank you. And Marie Haley. Thank you. Who goes back in Tampa to the time she was a very little girl, who attended Chamberlain High School, whose parents had a sundry shop called mm -hmm. Pickford. Uh, it, where was it? It was on Hillsborough Avenue, what they consider West Tampa. Sure. It, and you have seen the evolution of Tampa. Very much so. And besides leading an interesting life yourself. Very much Right so. now you're his partner in puzzlement. Mm -hmm. And between you two, you're having a great deal of fun, I know. Mm -hmm. And the puzzles True. are wonderful. Uh, are, are, you have been called in wi Wikipedia um, the most creative puzzle maker of this day. And I, I wondered how you began to go out of the traditional puzzle and begin to do theme puzzles. Is that hard? Uh, no, no. I was always a fan of stand-up comedians anyway. <laughs> you know, and to put, to in, infuse stand-up comedy or, or regular world humor. If you tell somebody a joke and they actually laugh, that's real world humor to me. And I'd never seen, like, real humor in a crossword puzzle before. Uh -huh. And so um, when I learned from the first New York Times crossword editor, whose name was Margaret Farrer, um, and the first letter I ever got from her, she said, crossword puzzles are entertaining first. They can be uh, challenging and educational second, but they've got to be entertaining first. And uh, I thought, well, okay, entertaining to me meant funny. So, um, and I'd been a fan of Bill Cosby and all the comedians since I was a kid. And so to me, entertaining meant to infuse crossword puzzles with a sense of humor. And so all the kinds of jokes and setups that I'd heard all my life you have to focus them down in a different way because crosswords are a different animal than just telling a joke. Um, but the same kind of thing is possible to get, you know, I'm not a bad duck, I'm just mal-adjusted, you know. <laughs> you know so right. just to get stuff like that into a puzzle was what I started doing. And, and uh, when we were living in Santa Monica, we, were, we would sit, go to a cafe and watch mm -hmm. a couple solve. And the couple, either he solves and she doesn't or the other way around. But uh, if the joke is right, she can tell the joke to the husband who doesn't solve crosswords, and he'll laugh. Okay, that's, the, that's what we're going for, is that, that, the, that the humor, the crossword humor has a life off the page. So someone can tell the joke I did on Sunday to somebody else, and so now suddenly a, a crossword is not just a flat thing on a page yeah. out of a dictionary that you saw, but it's mm -hmm. actually something you can pass on and talk about in right. the real world. And they'll remember your name. <laughs> Maybe. That's, <laughs> that's a big well, job. <laughs> well, that, that's interesting. I, I neglected to say you are not from Tampa, but um, New Jersey, as am I. Born there, yes. Audubon. Yes. Metuchen. You've never heard of Metuchen, I'm sure. I can spell it. I think it's M-E-T-U-C-H-E-N. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's right, right on the Penn Central. But at any rate, um, you're, I think you've come to a far, far warmer place. Yes, <laughs> less snow anyway. Less mm -hmm. snow, right. Um, give me a background of, of crosswords and then 
Tell me how you got interested in it as a kid. How far back do crosswords go? Crosswords go back to 1913. They were invented in New York City. Uh, a Sunday editor had a strange hole to fill in the Sunday magazine, <laughs> and um, he remembered little word squares from his youth as a kid in England. And so he decided to make a big version of one, kind of a diamond-shaped thing with clues and definitions and numbers and everything. That's the first time anyone had ever done that. His name was Arthur Wynne. And uh, this crossword puzzle, they were called word crosses back then, this word cross puzzle caught on immediately. And um, then solvers started sending in their versions of puzzles, even to the point where toward the end of the, like 1919 or so, even Arthur Wynne himself was tired of crossword puzzles. And the back shop was completely tired of them because they had to, remember, they had to set everything by hand, little numbers and squares and the clues. And so it was a nightmare for the shop, but it was because the solvers loved this new puzzle so much, they sent in their own, and so he just kept printing theirs. And then by the time 1924 rolled around, mm -hmm. um, uh, the first crossword puzzle book came out, and it sold hundreds of thousands of copies in a very short period of time. And um, so it was just something that wasn't going to go away. Maybe it's just that people have this insane urge to fill in blank squares. Who knows what the, what the reason is? But it's, it has a finite answer. It's like you know, all the puzzles and troubles you have during a day, maybe those don't have answers, but the crossword does. You can do the crossword in the morning and go off to work and think you've done something, you've right. accomplished something. Um, so they just, crosswords just were like something that was going to happen anyway. Uh, who knows? But they just have stuck with us all these years. They've evolved, of course. Um, they didn't have themes much in the early days. They didn't have, didn't much, not much humor. There was, even they were so popular in New York that they used to put dictionaries in the in the trains, in the commuter trains. Oh really? Yeah, and there was there's lots. I of don't remember those. <laughs> well, this was 1920, oh. <laughs> way before your time. Um, and there were divorces over them. There was a play on Broadway about crosswords. Uh, they were just the the happening thing. It was it was very chic, to talk about three-toed sloths and Malayan canoes and all these strange things from the dictionary. Nowadays, we kind of don't emphasize those. We try to get all that stuff out of a puzzle. But in those early days, all the exotic stuff in Crossroads was a big deal. People talked about them all the time. Well, that, that brings up another interesting point. Is there an etiquette to doing a Crossroads puzzle? That is, if you see something like Malayan canoe. <laughs> Do you run up to your you know, synonyms, antonyms book and start to pull um, through it? Well, a lot of crossword solvers do know this little menagerie of you know, all the crossword sure. animals. And they know if it, because there's not much cleverness you can do with a gnu or an emu. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. And so these are like, you know, when you see Australian bird or Serengeti stampeder, you know, it's, you know what those words are going to be. Mm -hmm. And so those are gimmies to an extent, but it's part of the, how the solving works for beginners. You usually go to the short answers first. Get a foothold on a short answer. If the, the clue is something like partly open as a door, you know it's a jar, which is a good word too because it's got a J in it, which is an unusual letter. That helps you get a foothold. This is why some people have no trouble solving in pen because they do the crossings at the same time. If they have a jar, they won't write in a jar first until they see what word crosses the J. Mm -hmm. If, like, uh, Mustard City is a clue, they know that Dijon works, all right? That has a J in it, so a jar must be right. So mm -hmm. you get a foothold on there. That's why solving in pen is actually doable. It's, it's not like an ego thing. Uh, a lot of people just like the way pen looks on paper. Um, but, but it is an ego thing. But it is, but I mean, it's, it's, but, I mean, it's, it's easy to do if you know the trick of sure. using both at the same time. Yeah. Well, I know the trick of it. It doesn't help me all that well, much. But you had something like Monday I tried the, the, the Times puzzle, and I was good on everything except a little out there. And it had little quotes, and I thought, space travel, out there, out there, out there. And it turned out to be, because I never did find, solve it, edgier. And like oh, out, a little out, out there, there, yeah, right. edgier, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and so that, that, was like a, that, that was like, you really have to rack your brain. You really have to think of alternative things. Yeah, you, can't, you won't find a little out there in the dictionary. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. Well, you decided to self-syndicate, and there is a, an association of crossword puzzlers. I asked you earlier, um, before the show began, whether there were many women in it, because I always seem to see male names. Well, there are lots of female constructors or, or puzzle makers. Um, and the syndication, that's how 
That's where Marie comes into play. Marie, when we were starting out, when you, if you're a crossword puzzle person and you make puzzles generally, you usually send them off someplace, either to a crossword magazine or a crossword book or to a syndicate that has a newspaper crossword. Um, the trouble is that you send it off, and in the old days, you got very little money for it, and, and you signed away all rights. So if it ever came out in book form, you know, you never saw any of that back-end money. And uh, when I was making puzzles for Dell Crosswords in the 70s and 80s, uh -huh. um, you know, they keep all the rights. They paid pretty well, but they keep all the rights. And um, I thought, mm. well, Marie and I both felt, yeah. well, if I'm going to make a living out of crosswords, which almost nobody does, right. then it'd be nice to own the puzzles. Okay. And the only way to own the puzzles is to somehow start our own syndicate and to talk newspapers into buying it. Now, newspapers are normally used to working with syndicates, established syndicates. But Marie said, no, 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 let's fly to Seattle. Let's go to <laughs> Seattle and talk to the editor up there and tell him that they had three, sun three crosswords on Sunday. One was the New York Times, one was something else, and one was this, I will, it will be re it'll remain nameless, but it was oh, sure. a not very good Sunday crossword. Mm -hmm. we should, they should kick that out and put, put us in. And so, now I would never fly, I would never get in a plane and fly to Seattle to go talk like that. But Marie, yeah. being a business person and a person who says, well, this is what we got to do, so let's do it. So we did it, and we talked to the managing editor. She, mm -hmm. she had no idea there were such things as, as funny crosswords. So, <laughs> and we actually cracked her up with some of the gags from the puzzles. She said, okay, we'll try you out. We try, tried us out. The, the fans voted for us, which mm -hmm. never happens. They had an actual... Uh, uh, number to call. Number to call. Oh, Maybe yeah. choose right. the thumbs old up or thumbs like down. American right. Idol. Yeah. yeah. So actually, it was Crossword Idol. Yes, yes, it was. Yes, and we won two to one, almost two bad. to one. Which all you got to do is, if you hate the puzzle, just call up fifty thousand times saying, "But that didn't happen." <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it started. So it became, how many newspapers can we get into, um, where you know Marie is the person that is the business side right. so and the other idea was once the puzzle appears in, on Sunday maybe five to six years later it comes out in book form mm -hmm. okay well how do you publish a book how do you publish your own crossword puzzle books so that they actually sell you know so we that's the business thing too we yeah. went around about that so that's the other part we have two part there's two sides of our business one is the puzzle comes out every Sunday yeah. now it's eight years later the crosswords come out in book form and we sell those too. Right. So we're the only self-syndicated Sunday crossword in the whole country. That's very smart. Mm -hmm. And it's a partner in puzzlement here. Yes. What brought you together? <laughs> oh. A crossword convention. No, <laughs> nothing no. like that. No, 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 no. no Never no. a crossword. No. <laughs> no, we were living in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I went, since I made puzzles early in the morning, five or six o'clock a.m., I would go to this place called Kenny's Deli, the block from my house. And I would sit in there in the morning, you have an endless cup of coffee anyway, so I'm in there, I have a breakfast before anybody else is there. This was an all-nighter place, too. And I would just make crossroads over in the corner, you know. And another early riser, Marie, eventually came in, and she was sitting at the counter once. And this restaurant had a counter and then a break for the waiters to go through, and then more of the counter. I was sitting on one, and, and I was telling the waitress about uh, The Shining, which had just come in 1981. Yeah. And... Um, I was actually trying to pick her up, not Marie. That's um, true. But um, <laughs> after, but, but she wasn't interested. But Marie was interested, so I started talking to Marie, and then Marie actually followed me home, just to the door. Right. And then, <laughs> and, but uh, you know, I thought she was really interesting, and she invited me out to a, a play, and then we were friends for two years, and then we started going together after that, and. Um, the rest is puzzle history. <laughs> That's right. The rest is puzzle history. history. Business history. Yeah. I think it's a marvelous combination. Mm. And, and um, although you may have left Tampa when it was still puttering along, yes. <laughs> let us say, um, uh, you decided both to come back. And what have you, as a, as a, um, a product of Tampa, as it were, grew up and attended high school here, and your parents were rooted in the community. And, That's true. And you feel, uh, I'm sure, an affinity for the this, for this city. Are you pleased with what's happened to it? Oh, very much so. I, yeah. I must admit it was so slow in happening. I, I came back, and even in 1993, I had this sinking feeling this was never going to happen. I can remember even in two, early 2000s, I'd look around and I'd think, will I ever live long enough to see Tampa the way I'd like to see it? And now, I would say in the last five years, it has changed wonderfully. And now I call you know, friends 
and tell them, you know, Tampa's worth seeing. It's, yes. it's really highlighting its waterfront. Its downtown looks like a little city. You've got interesting restaurants. You've got theater that's really springing up. I really like the theater. I like the theater. I took my pennies when I was only 10 years old and put them together because I wasn't, didn't have much money, and I went and bought a season ticket to the little, Tampa Little Theater. That's how I would, devoted I am you to You probably Paul. saw Helen Gordon Davis at some point. Probably did. Yeah, because probably she was did. one of the, the, the prima donnas of that acting company. Right. That's very interesting. And then and the uh, thing I would say is I did, took, took Merle to a play. That's, sure. I took him out to the play in, in Santa Monica. Right. But it had widen your horizons. Have you ever done a play motif for a puzzle? Oh, yes. In fact, for, uh, well, I forget the name of the theater, boy. Uh, there's a very famous uh, theater in Washington, D.C. Since I'm in the Post, um, I got American a call. American Stage? American yeah. Stage? I think it's American Stage. Mm -hmm. um, well, their 60th birthday was a year or two ago. And the guy who's their main PR guy is a big Crossford fan. He used to solve me in California. Then he moved around the country and ended up in Washington, D.C. and wanted to know um, if I could make a special commemorative puzzle for the 60th birthday of the theater. And I said, sure, I'd love to. So I was, it was, uh, they, he sent me a list of all the plays they'd ever done, and I did a puzzle that just basically messed with the names of all these, <laughs> you know, strange, I forget, I should have remembered any, some of them, but they're just puns on, on famous plays. Oh, great, uh, good. That's very interesting. Uh, do you have any idea how many people do crossword puzzles? Uh, Maybe in America? In or? America, it's probably, gosh, it's hard to know, because no one ever knows this kind of thing. Sure. I'd say probably 10 million on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, some estimates go up to 30 million, 50 million. But I, I just, I don't know about that. I know that if you count all the people who ever saw crosswords, even in a laundromat, yes. you know, the easy, really easy ones, it might be up. <laughs> Laundromat puzzles that's easier what, than most. That's what I call them, yeah. No. Woody plant tree, you know, <laughs> rin tin blank <laughs> right. tin. You know. um, it's just to pass the time. I mean, it's not sure. like, but uh, you know how they say about for Alzheimer's, the more that your brain actually works, the, more, the harder the puzzles are, the better it is for your brain. So if you just sort of go through rote memory puzzles. Right. But you want, you want the harder stuff. But sure. I'd say, I would guess 15, 20 million. There is an interesting statistic. Uh, in the Los Angeles Times, where Merle's Puzzle appears, mm -hmm. we just found out that 25% of all hits, because it's on the, uh, on the web, 25% mm -hmm. of all hips, hits are for his puzzle. And, and you have your own website, too. Yes, yes. right. And you all also have a puzzle. It's the same puzzle. I mean, it's the same oh, puzzle that well, appears that's everywhere. Fine, but it is yeah. for people to, to be oh, able yeah. to work out. Yeah, SundayCrosswords.com. So that's, that's a very nice thing to do. I think. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to live in a particular city to get us, to get us, to get us. To get us. Um, <laughs> um, to get us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you can just go to our site, which is yeah. sundaycrosswords.com, and there's a, you can either solve it online, mm -hmm. graphically, or you can just download a copy of it, which I do up every week, so it's the, the grid is real big, the clues are real big, or as big as they can be on a one, okay. one page. Um, yeah, that's got to get the puzzles yeah. to the people. Well, how did wordplay come about? Did, were you on Oprah and, and Nightline and so forth because of wordplay or? The other way around. Ah. Um, Patrick Creedon was a director. Uh, he'd been, he never directed a documentary on his own. He was a, a cameraman in Hollywood. He, had, he was a cameraman on a lot of TV shows, but he and his wife, Christine O'Malley, had, had worked on other people's projects, but they had never done a project on their own, and he was a big crossword fan. And so he found out that there was a tournament every year and thought he'd go, he would do the first crossword documentary to the uh, absolute horror of his family who thought that who would ever go to see a crossword documentary? I mean, it sounds like watching paint dry, right? Um, but he, he thought it would be a good idea. So Patrick and his wife, Christine, go to the tournament in 2005, I think it was, That's right. and, and filmed the tournament and filmed eight or so people who normally do well at the tournament beforehand. This is very similar, similar to how Spellbound was done, uh -huh. where they interviewed uh, really good spellers before they went to the actual spelling bee. Right. This was the same idea. They interviewed a lot of these people up here before they went to the event. They uh, ate, like at least they thought maybe at least three of them would be up on stage for the final. And so Patrick and Christine were filming, were at the event, and uh, they had a lot of questions. And I'm a judge at the event every year, and I have a puzzle in it every year. 
And so I just became, and I've been going to it since 1980, so I am, I'm almost a walking historian about the tournament. So every time a question came up, Patrick would lean on me about who's this, what's this, what's going on. So I became like the default information guy. Plus, Patrick is an incredibly nice guy. We hit it off immediately. So just to hang out with him was great. Mm -hmm. And so as the, as the filming went along, I was just the guy that he was talking to all the time. At that time also, I'm, I was the play-by-play -play guy for the final puzzle. The final puzzle is up on stage, three big puzzles so the whole room can see, and the, and the finalists have headphones on so they can't hear what the two commentators say. Uh -huh. And one of the commentators was Neil Conan from NPR and myself. I'm like the... Uh, the background guy, so the color. The color. He does the color, oh, yeah. yeah. And so I've, I've done that for many, many years, too. So I had a lot, I mean, I have a big role at the tournament, or usually every year. And so I was just like the guy to talk to. And so that's how that all came about. So I ended up being in the movie way more than I thought I was going to be. But, uh -huh. uh, and then when it came time to explain things off camera, he flew back to my house and did a great interview at my house where uh -huh. a lot of the stuff you see in the movie, of, of the, the interview in a house is at our house. Uh -huh. Where I talk about those rules and things. Right. The ru well, I, I take it the, the number one rule is the time element, right? It has to be solved within a certain period of time. At the tournament, uh, not necessarily. I mean, no kidding. No, I mean there's a there's a limit in like 15 minutes or 20 minutes on the on the puzzles, mm -hmm. and the puzzles get bigger as the tournament goes on, and the, and the time gets longer. Right. And and once. 20 minutes is up, you have to turn your paper over if you're not done. But in real, real life, I mean, that's an aberration. Solving against time is an aberration. Uh, at home, when you're or at the, or in the office or at Starbucks, when you're solving a puzzle, there's no time limit. You just time. In fact, if you, if you speed through it, we always say you're not going to pick up on how much fun the puzzle was to solve. Right. Um, right. But at a tournament, you kind of have to do speed solving. But at home or at the office or whatever, take your, we take your sweet time. And it's one of your attractions of it, too, that, it, that it's portable. You yes. Know? You can take yes. it everywhere. And, right. And it's your puzzle, basically, yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, um, how did The Simpsons approach you? Well, The Simpsons came about because James L. Brooks, who was one of the main producers on The Simpsons, mm -hmm. saw wordplay. And he went at one of the meetings where all the writers were s sitting around. He said, you know, we ought to do an episode of The Simpsons where... Lisa gets hooked on crossword puzzles. I mean, who else in The Simpsons would, would get hooked That's on right. crosswords other than Lisa? <laughs> exactly. uh, so Lisa gets hooked on crosswords. She enters a tournament. Um, Homer bets against her, and she disowns him, and then he has to do something to win her back. You know, th so I think, I think all of that, I think, James, we, I think James L. Brooks had all of that plot mm -hmm. already when he walked into the, to the meeting. Right. And so... Um, one of the writers, Tim Long, came back with an idea that James L. Brooks thought was great, and so Tim Long got to write the episode, mm -hmm. and so the episode became the uh, Homer and Lisa exchange cross words, where indeed that's what happens. She gets hooked on puzzles, she enters the tournament, and Homer originally is going to bet for her to win until she says, I don't know if I, you know, I don't deserve to win. And then <laughs> No, she loses faith in yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, she loses faith in herself, so he loses faith in, in her. her. He does that so, very easily. Yeah, right. very easily. So he goes into the bar and bets for her to lose, and she does lose, so he makes tons of money, and, uh, but she finds out about it, disowns him, uh, and to win, to win her back, Homer pays uh, Will Shorts and myself to do a special New York Times puzzle uh -huh. to apologize to her. Uh. And that puzzle actually appeared on the Sunday morning when the episode came out. Oh, how fun. Now, the, now the apology was all hidden, yeah. so you, you probably could solve the puzzle and not even notice that there was anything of a Simpsons nature in it. Mm -hmm. Merle constructed that puzzle. Yeah, I made that yeah. puzzle. Very yeah. elaborate. Yeah. I bet. I, I think that's it's such a specialty. And, and, yes. and <laughs> as I said, when you start at six, I said, what kind of a gene do you have that nobody else seems to have? That, it's called the crossword gene. The strange person gene. <laughs> 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 But but on the other hand, you haven't memorized the fifty states and you or, you know and every and the the capitals and everything else, so it's it's very very particular particular. Well, I actually do know the names of the states <laughs> and all the capitals. You can. <laughs> oh. I mean, I know. As well, Mr. Well, I used know. to call him Mr. Encyclopedic <laughs> He's line. He's a genius. Well, well that's yes, what. Well, that's when the last thing on Oprah, the last thing Oprah said was, "You must be really smart." And I said, "No, I just know a lot of baloney," <laughs> which is true. <laughs> that's funny. Mm. Well, did you bring your business acumen? It sounds like you did. You really made a, a, a sort of a unique 
uh, economic venture here. That's true. Well, I was very lucky because even though I have a background in science and I thought I was going to teach college, mm -hmm. I have a master's in science, and uh, then I worked for hospital supply companies for 10 years. Wow. And they were very sophisticated. They showed me exactly what it took to market products, mm -hmm. what customers wanted, how you present the products, how you talk to people, how you talk to doctors and heads of laboratories, how you travel. I mean, my life was actually like up in the air, the George Clooney film. Yes. For 10 years, it was just, just like, like up that. In the air. Just <laughs> like up in the air. Oh, yes, Without it was. The guys. Uh, well, actually, well, actually. <laughs> we won't go there. We won't go there. But it was the conventions and, and, the, and the craziness and the alcohol and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it mm -hmm. was part of my life. Wow. And I got very tired of it. I I got very tired of not being home, and, and it was just at that time I met Merle. And so I had this 10 years of experience of marketing, and that kind of came into play. Mm -hmm. It was like I was ready to do this thing, and I saw he had this amazing talent that I'd never seen anything quite like it before. And I thought, oh, yes, this could happen. For instance, I saw Robin Williams long before he made it, and I thought, I would love to be his agent. I know this man can make it. Uh -huh. So it's like I sort of had a sense you, of the possibility. You recognize that. I recognize that God-given ability. Right. Well, we are, we are certainly uh, delighted that you also recognize that Tampa is a wonderful place to live in yes. and operate out of. Um, I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you stay because it, it really has given Tampa a little Philip, a little, uh, a very, a, a kind of a panache that other cities uh, only wish they could have, <laughs> I think. Uh, and I know you've been speaking to various groups, and, and, uh, and it, it's amazing how many people respond, how many people who do this don't really talk about it necessarily, unless they're saying, well, what do you think this crew mm -hmm. means? Uh, and then, and yet when it comes to having someone who is really at the, the, the very highest level of creativity, do it, people just flock. So it's, it's a great thing. Mm. And One of the most interesting things that, I've, that I personally have always loved being with him, and it's been several decades now, yeah. we go into the smallest little town, we all usually go to a bookstore, and somebody will know his name. Yes. And I've seen it all over this country. Oh, that's fun. That is wonderful. That's it's wonderful. like having relatives everywhere. It, it, it does. Good it, it, and the cross Good and the everywhere. puzzles are the connector. Yes, it is. And, yeah. and people have that, that same uh, sort of uh, attachment to it and delight in it, which, oh. yeah, which is wonderful. And the other thing yes. I'd say is the interesting people's minds that we've gotten into. It's... Uh, well, I'm glad, I'm glad that you're here, and uh, it's not saying welcome to Tampa, but glad you're in Tampa, you. and it's been a wonderful conversation, and it's, it's 30 minutes is up. It looks like 10, maybe 5. <laughs> we'll have to do it again some other time and explore even others. Thank you for being with us.